This is a picture of David. You may have heard of him. He's the boy who had to live his entire life in a bubble, cut off from direct contact with other people and from the outside environment. He had to live this way because he was missing his adaptive immune system. He still had his innate immune system, which is quite powerful and does a pretty good job fighting off infections on its own. However, without an adaptive immune system, he could not last long in facing the microbial predators. The adaptive immune system has some very special properties. It is able to mount responses that are specific to individual pathogens and even individual molecules called antigens. The adaptive immune system is able to remember that it has seen particular pathogens or molecules before and this memory is able to confer long-term protection. This immune system is very special. The adaptive immune system is found only in jawed vertebrates. The one drawback is that it takes one to two weeks for it to actually become effective, which is why we need to rely on our innate immune system after exposure until our adaptive immune system kicks in. Here we show that really the vertebrates that have adaptive immunity are only a small part of the entire tree of life. All of the rest of the organism on, on uh, Earth rely only upon innate immunity. They are waging chemical warfare, but because their immune systems cannot change, they are born and die with the same immune system. Now vertebrates, especially us, because we are, have large size, complex structure, and because we have long lifespans, we ha would have a real problem with a static immune system, as powerful as it might be, because all our microbial predators are constantly evolving and adapting, and if they have are able to change and acquire new weapons in time scales of weeks to months, and our immune defenses can't change over scales of tens of years, that would make us sitting ducks. This is why we have adaptive immunity. It provides homeland security for our bodies. These are the questions we'll address in the uh, next several slides. What are the main components? What do we use to detect foreign invaders? and what are the weapons that we use to clean them out and kill them off. It turns out that our adaptive immune system is almost limitless in the kinds of molecules that it can recognize and respond to. Millions and millions, and including molecules it has never before seen, or molecules that have never been seen on the Earth before. How does it have this remarkable capability? And how does the immune system memory work anyway? This chart simply illustrates both properties of the adaptive immune system, specificity and memory. If at time zero you have virus A infecting, then here's our lag period after it takes at least a week before we see antibody molecules and we'll talk a little bit more about those shortly, that can bind to virus A and begin to eliminate it from our bodies. So after virus A has been eliminated, our antibodies go back down to lower levels. Let's say around 28 or 29 days, we're reinfected by a mixture of virus A plus a new virus or new strain called virus B. Well, our immune system, having seen virus A before, mounts an immediate and much stronger response, much more antibodies that are able to eliminate virus A. However, these same antibodies are completely ineffective against virus B because they're specific to A. And the immune system, having never seen an, uh, virus B before, again, takes at least another week or so before it can make antibodies to virus B. Hence, the specificity, memory, and the lag. 
Our adaptive immune system compose, is composed of two major branches. They're called the humoral and cell-mediated. Humoral simply means that it is composed of soluble molecules. For our adaptive immune system, the soluble molecules are antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that are produced by B cells that have differentiated into what are called plasma cells. And you can think of plasma cells as antibody-producing factories. They secrete antibodies. There are five different types of antibodies, or classes of antibodies. In our blood and lymphatic circulation, the primary antibody is IgG. Okay? Antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins. And the shorthand for immunoglobulins is Ig. So IgG is immunoglobulin G. That's our major antibody in the blood and lymph. In mucus tears, milk, and saliva, the major antibody type molecule is IgA. And then there are three other rare antibody types circulating in our system that we're not going to have time to discuss. As for the cell-mediated branch, what we have are killer T cells, these so-called cytotoxic T cells. Their main job is to eliminate, kill off the body's own cells that are harboring viruses or the body's own cells that have turned cancer cells or have turned cancers. A secondary effect of, of their uh, activity against uh, strange looking cells or strangely behaving cells is that any foreign cells uh, that are grafted or introduced into the body, even if it's from a, another human, um, are eliminated by these cytotoxic T cells. And here is the armamentarium, actually, are the detection system for foreign molecules. On the left, we show antibodies, also called immunoglobulins, and on the right, we show uh, T cells uh, sitting in the membrane in a T cell receptor complex. So T cell receptors are membrane proteins, they're cell surface proteins um, on the surface of T cells, and they serve as the antigen receptor for uh, T cells. Antibodies are uh, usually circulating in the blood and they're secrete proteins, but there is also a form of antibody that can be a membrane antigen receptor for B cells. So they're both secreted and membrane-bound found forms of antibody molecules. So both antibodies and T cell receptors are the primary antigen receptors for our adaptive immune system. Now, each antibody recognizes a particular antigen, and so does each T cell. Our bodies are capable of making tens of millions of different antibody molecules and tens of millions of different T cell receptors. So you can think about that while we uh, explain the structures of antibody molecules and T cell receptors. Each of these antigen receptors are, have quaternary structure, uh, meaning they're composed of multiple polypeptide chains that are assembled together to form a single protein. An antibody molecule is symmetric, so if we draw a line here, the left half is identical to the right half. If we look at just one half, we see that it has a light chain. The light chain consists of these two blobs. And the heavy chain, the heavy chain consists of these four segments. All of these antigen receptors have a modular construction. Each of these sort of rectangular things is a domain or a single module. So a light con chain, chain consists of uh, one module cons called a, a constant light chain domain and a variable domain. Okay. And a heavy chain consists of a, a heavy uh, chain variable domain um, and then three constant heavy chain domains. 
Now, the variable domains that are color-coded in blue, as the name suggests, are variable. These ch uh, vary in amino acid sequence from, uh, from all the different antibodies. So each antibody molecule has different amino acid sequences in their variable domain, but they have common amino acid sequences in their constant domains. One light chain variable domain and one heavy chain variable domain together consists of a single antigen binding uh, pocket. So they together create an, a one antigen binding surface or pocket. Since the two halves of the molecule are identical, uh, the, an antibody molecule is able to bind two copies of the same protein. A T cell receptor similarly is, has a modular construction. It has a variable domain here. These two are variable domains. The two polypeptide chains are called alpha and beta, and these are the constant domains of the alpha and beta chains. And again, like the immunoglobulins, one alpha variable domain and one beta variable domain together consist, make a single antigen binding pocket or surface. So a T cell receptor binds one molecule of antigen. These other proteins shown here as part of the T cell receptor complex are accessory molecules that help the T cell receptor to signal. So I just got done telling you that our body is able to make tens of millions of different antigen receptors. Well, if you've uh, uh, read about the human genome or learned about the hum human genome, uh, you have no doubt uh, remember that the human genome encodes only a little over 20,000 different proteins. And here we're talking about tens of millions of different proteins to encode all of these antigen receptors. How is that possible? Well, the answer comes from looking at the DNA that encodes the an these antigen receptor proteins. If we look at, for instance, uh, an immunoglobulin gene, Okay. and look at the portion of the gene that contains the, the encodes the V domains, what we see is that in this portion of the DNA, there are hundreds of, hundreds of DNA segments that encodes parts of the variable domain. And then there are tens of shorter segments, called the D and J segments, that also encode parts of the variable domain. In a developing B cell, what happens is that the DNA encoding this uh, region undergoes rearrangement. We have DNA splicing. So don't confuse this with RNA splicing. This is splicing of the genomic DNA, the chromosomal DNA in these cells. And it occurs so precisely and in a controlled fashion so that in a B cell, one of these D segments gets joined to one of these J segments, and any DNA that's intervening between the DN that separates the selected D and J segments gets discarded. Okay? And these are, are joined together. Okay? So we have a joined D and J segment. After that, one of these hundreds of V segments are selected, and joined together to the DJ joint segments. So we get a VDJ joint segment, um, and any again, any DNA that's uh, in between gets discarded. So let's see how this works. Okay. So in a, to uh, make a, a variable domain for the immunoglobulin heavy chain, we need one V segment, one D segment, and one J segment. And if any V can be joined to any D and, and to any J, then we have random combinatorial joining. So let's say, for example, we have 200 V domains times 10 D segments times 10 J segments. That gives us 2 times 10 to the fourth different V, D, J combinations. 
assuming that any of these combinations are viable and they can occur randomly. Light chain only undergoes one DNA range, rearrangement. Let's say there's 100 V segments and 10 J segments, and that gives us 10 to the fourth, I mean 10 to the third, sorry, uh, VJ segments. Okay? Now remember to make a complete and functional antigen binding domain, we need one light chain and one heavy chain. So how many different heavy plus light chain combinations are there? Then we have 2 times 10 to the fourth VDJ heavy chains, and assuming then they can be uh, combined together with any of these 1,000 light chains, that gives us 2 times 10 to the seventh, or 20 million possible uh, antibody molecules. For T-cell receptors, the math is uh, very similar.